Go to Marius. The man who needs to do plapper and plapper and plapper. Yeah, I'm Peter Letkeman. They've asked me, Eileen asked me to host this session. <clears throat> Our first speaker is uh, Miss Naomi Fast from Germany. She was born in Karaganda, and that's where I first met her and her parents, her mother, Lydia, and her father, Reverend Victor Fast. They were both prominent leaders of the Karaganda Mennonite Brethren Church, a huge church in Karaganda. <clears throat> Uh, the family was lucky to be able to come to Germany in 1993 <clears throat> and uh, settle in Frankenthal in central, south central Germany, which is where a lot of the former Mennonite brethren members from Karaganda MB Church settled in Frankenthal and founded the Frankenthal MB Church. And that's where Naomi lives and works. Uh, she began studying history and literature at the uh, Johannes Gott, uh, Gutenberg University in Mainz and, and spent uh, 12 years working for her father's uh, publishing company. Uh, all the uh, Mennonite leaders from Karaganda founded Zamenkorn Verlag and uh, she worked for 12 years as an editorial assistant, editing papers, editing books, writing lots of articles herself, which were published in their magazine called Aquila, which started in the late 90s and is still going strong every three months. Um, and, but then she also has a great interest in social work, so she quit her job and became a social worker. She studied social sciences, and since 2018, she's been working as a social worker in Frankenthal and vicinity, working especially with autistic children, with underprivileged children who come from difficult family situations, and also in recent years, so many refugees have come to Germany. She's also worked with refugee families because she speaks several different languages and, and has, has helped to, to work with them. And as part of her uh, master's work and uh, M master of social work, uh, she had to write a thesis. And so she wrote a thesis that combines history and social work. And she wrote a phenomenal thesis on uh, the Mennonite orphanage in Grossweide, which, which is in the Molochna. Um, and uh, she will be sharing some parts of her thesis with us this morning. Good morning, bitte schön. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Peter. Um, I must say I'm very, very sorry uh, for not being there together with you now and for missing the chance to meet you all in person. Uh, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate at least online and present my paper on the orphanage in Grossweide, Malochna, um, even if it's uh, only through the screen. Um, I have to add to what you said, Peter, uh, that I'm still in my research about this orphanage. I have written several things about it, but um, if anybody can contribute something to it, I will be very, very um, thankful. Um, so let me start about the orphanage. It was operated by Abraham and Justina Harder from 1906 to 1922. Most of the orphanage workers and orphans ended up among that group of Mennonites who managed to escape the Soviet Union in the 1920s and made it to Canada. So maybe some of your ancestors have been among this group of people. But that's not the only reason for me to talk about the orphanage today at this conference. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me start with this postcard. You can see a building with several people in front of it and the inscription that says, Orphanage in Grossweide in South Russia. Remember the starving orphans. This colored photograph was used as a fundraising tool to be sent to supporters overseas, asking for help during a very difficult period in Ukraine. It probably originates from the famine of 1921-22, after the civil war uh, that had devastated large swaths of Ukraine. Next slide. This is the original black and white version of the photograph. It's the best known image of this institution. It shows buildings, facilities, and people in an idyllic setting. As I will argue in this paper, 
This social institution in South Russia provides us with an excellent looking glass into the state of the Mennonite community in a time of tremendous outer and inner developments, which changed the well-established order of the Mennonite world forever, as we know now. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, a view of the orphanage. Um, as I already said, it was founded in 1906 in the village of Grossweide at the east perimeter of the Molochna colony. Abraham and Justina Harder, the founders, had sold their farm on the Crimean Peninsula and used all their own money to buy an abandoned factory in order to establish an orphanage. Um, Abraham Harder's diary and the articles he and his co-workers Johann Jans and Dietrich Esau wrote for the Friedensstimme the Mennonitische Rundschau and Mennonitisches Jahrbuch give us some insight into the orphanage's operation. During the second winter of the orphanage's existence, the Harders started a school for the orphans. And in 1911, they built a school building, which they named Eben Ezer in reverence to the scripture uh, from 1 Samuel 7. The Harder children, they had nine of them, uh, grew up together with the orphans, and the older ones worked in the orphanage together with their parents. The orphanage, which was growing steadily in its impact as well as, as its grounds and facilities, was suddenly shaken by the outbreak of World War I. Some of the workers, among them the only teacher, Dietrich Esau, were drafted into the medical service of the Russian army. During the revolution and civil war, the orphanage underwent many tribulations and hardships. The biggest concern was the procurement of food. And there are many stories in the hardest accounts of those years about God's miraculous provisions so that the 80 orphans and about 30 staff members survived those hard years. In 1919, the hardest eldest son, uh, son uh, Abraham Jr. Harder and his newlywed wife, Helena Ne Janssen, who had been working at the orphanage for many years, established a second orphanage in Neuhalbstadt. And this orphanage now functioned as a second branch for Russian children. And by Russian, they meant Ukrainians and all the other nationalities that have been there. In 1922, the orphanage was forcibly taken over by the communists and the Harder family together with their Mennonite staff had to leave. So in total, the orphanage, which was meant to be a life work operated only 16 years and had been the home of 133 Mennonite orphans in total. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, this is a picture of the Harders with, uh, with their children at some point of the operation. Uh, the Harders lost the orphanage at a time that was characterized by full-scale famine. Not willing to surrender the children to starvation and death, Abraham Harder did his best to place as many of his works in Mennonite families who were willing to take them as he could. This way, a number of the orphans made their way to Canada with their foster parents, same as several staff members, among them some of the Harder's uh, children. The Harder's oldest son, Abraham, and his wife, Helena, migrated to Germany first, then to Paraguay, and finally, uh, finally to Canada. Another part of the family stayed in the Soviet Union. And the descendants of this charitable family are scattered around the world today. One of them, Maria Lotzmanova, is here at this conference and she will give a talk later. So the question is, in what way is the hardest orphanage an indicator for the state of the Mennonite community in the early 20th century? Um, well, first of all, it gives us clues about the way a society treats its weakest members. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Let's briefly consider the, Men consider the Mennonite society in Russia around 1900. The Mennonites were by now very well established in the empire. During the hundred years of settling there, they had built several colonies, many schools, churches, factories, and other, uh, and other, other businesses, and had spread widely throughout the empire. In 1911, the industrial production of the Kortica colony with a population of about 12,000 people, represented 10% of the total industrial production of the Russian Empire. Just imagine that. Uh, this corresponds with the entire city of Moscow, with a population of one and a half million. Uh, 
it, Moscow produced 10% of the industrial production of the country as well. So one can say the Mennonites of Russia were very industrious, very successful, and one can assume richly blessed by God. Next slide, please. Um, we can also see around the turn of the century, the establishment of several social institutions, such as the hospitals in Muntau, Orlov, in Waldheim, the school for deaf in Tige, the mental hospital, Betania in Einlage, and others. And um, another aspect is as well that the MB church was more or less accepted among the bigger uh, Mennonite society. The schism was already 40 years ago. And both churches had its missionaries in the country as well as overseas. They run Sunday schools, choir festivals, missionary conferences, and so on. So spiritual life in the Mennonite colonies seemed to be as prosperous as the economy. Next slide. Um, yet just precisely in this time of abundance and prosperity, there is a young man, son of preacher and grandson of an outstanding elder, comes to the conclusion, um, even in my younger years, I felt an inner urge to do something for the orphans. So why did he feel that urge? He doesn't explain it, one can only assume. Why was an orphanage necessary? Uh, next slide. It was custom among Mennonite society to place orphans in other families, usually relatives, but it could be unrelated families as well. The Mennonites had their own dedicated system of orphan care, which basically consisted of three components. The orphan office, which cared for the finances and ensured proper distribution of the inheritance, the legal guardian and the foster family. To understand how the system worked, let's take a look. Uh, I wanted to take, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to take a look on three examples, but I have to skip them because of the time. Um, just uh, saying at this place that if anybody has stories of orphans being placed in foster families from their ancestors, I'll be very happy to, to get them and to collect them. Um, I had prepared three uh, examples and at least one of them shows that an orphan girl had been treated very, very bad in her foster family. Um, so, uh, so now next slide, please. Um, if Abraham Harder felt the urge to do something for the orphans, we have to assume that he must have witnessed the plight of orphans in uh, Mennonite communities in more than just one case. Maybe he had seen bad treatment of orphans by their foster families, contributing to, to the trauma of the loss uh, of their parents and their homes. So for the Harders, founding an orphanage was a big goal in life that they wanted to accomplish at any cost. In his diary, Abram writes in great detail about his fervent prayers and the great difficulties he encountered. The Harders sold their property on the Crimean Peninsula and moved back to the Molochna, where they originated from, giving us a clue to the hardships they endured to see their dream come true. Initially, a very suitable plot of land was promised to them in Kurushan, uh, which located about in the middle of the Molochna colony. Um, but then the offer was uh, taken back. Twelve years later, Abraham writes, um, next slide. In order to start an orphanage, I sought my help from people, but had to bury one prospect after another. But wonderfully, God gave birth to our work, carried it on, and had preserved it to this day. I especially think of the time when I was with the Oberschulze Nickel from Münsterberg and presented the cause to him, when I asked him whether the community would let us have the large shepherd's hut for the foundation of an orphanage, he replied, uh, if we didn't, it would be as if we answered children calling out from a dark cellar, help us out with no, we don't. And then Harder continues, how deeply it cut my heart and what struggles it cost me when the community rejected my request after all, God only knows. Next slide. In the end, Harder bought an abandoned factory plot using all his savings of 500 rubles, as well as 200 rubles he had to borrow from wealthy estate owner Nikolai Schmidt. Uh, 
Later, Schmidt donated that sum to the orphanage and supported it with several large donations. Uh, we can see that the orphanage was mostly funded by the private initiative of the Harder family. However, it was supported by several prominent members of the society as well. Um, this slide is showing um, a, a map of Grossweide with the orphanage in the left corner. Um, next slide. Um, so this is uh, Nicolai Schmidt and his wife Justina and their large estate in Steinbach. Um, Abraham Harger mentions them quite often in his diary and in his letters. So they were friends and uh, the Schmidt family supported uh, the orphanage financially and in other ways as well. Next slide, please. So another supporter was Abraham Craker, the editor of the Friedenstimme, the popular periodical that was distributed broadly among the Mennonite society all over the country. It's probably mostly thanks to him that the orphanage was featured often and lar largely in a very positive light. Some of the reports feature a reproach directed at the Mennonite community in regard to their attitude toward the orphanage, such as in the announcement of the inauguration, as you can see on the next slide. Um, this slide shows um, the text of um, Abraham Harder's announcement of the inauguration of the orphanage, and then the note of Abraham Craker. This young work is still little or not at all known in wide circles of our Mennonite community. In many cases, it is encountered with prejudice, or at least in a wait and see attitude. The establishment and maintenance of the institution is based entirely on the principle of voluntary Christian love. I would therefore like to ask all brothers and sisters in Christ, whom the Lord had blessed with earthly means, to ask themselves before God whether they do not also have a task here. It would also be advisable to go there and take a look at the work. Abraham Craker. Um, so next slide. Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Among the supporters was uh, also the outstanding preacher, elder and missionary Heinrich Dirks, as well as the missionary couple Hubert and other preachers and missionaries. Um, can you uh, just switch to the next slide? Yeah, okay, this is a correct one. Um, so this is Heinrich Dirks. Uh, Dirks defines the meaning of the orphanage for the Mennonite society as a local need that has been felt along the way, because it is not always possible to find people who can offer a second home to an orphan child. Then Dirks continues with an admonishment. However, by founding the orphanage, let no one who has the possibility and opportunity to take in a poor child be held back from doing so. And let this work of charity be pushed away from him, remembering the word, whoever takes in such a child takes in me, the word of Jesus. This kind of care for fatherless and motherless children should always be given preference over placement in orphanages. This is what Dirk said. Um, then please the slide back because I think I'm, I changed places of them. So. The previous slide, please. Okay. The orphanage had a community of supporters who donated all kinds of goods, food, money, household goods, such as brooms and potato peelers and other things, and toys. Um, the donations were regularly documented in the Friedenstimme. Among the donors are Sunday school group, groups, women clubs, sewing clubs, and other associations associations, as well as private individuals. So next slide and next, yeah, this one. But it seems that in the colonies, there were also rumors and prejudice directed against the orphanage as demonstrated in a letter by teacher Johann Jans to the Friedensstimme. He refers to the prejudices concerning the harders belonging to the MB church and therefore presumably preferring MB or orphans or um, the prejudice that um, he uses the donated money for building upkeep, building upkeep rather than saving it for the orphan's future and other things. He harshly accuses his fellow Mennonites of being heartless. For example, when the guardians don't visit their wards and inquire after them, as the quote shows that I've placed on the presentation. Um, so next slide. Reading the memoirs and accounts written by former occupants of the orphanage gives us an impression of their life at the orphanage. 
Even by our modern standards, the environment of the orphanage was very child friendly. They had orchards and large playgrounds to play in. The children were provided with all kinds of toys. They even had a bowling alley, which surely was the only one in the entire colony. As one of the orphans, Heinrich Reger, later recounts, they had also bicycles, ponies, and special toys, which the other children that lived in their own families didn't have, probably. Um, next uh, slide. This image, is, for example, shows a snowball fight in the yard of the uh, orphanage. Um, next slide. The orphanage included different kinds of facilities and opportunities for education and leisure activities. I've already mentioned the school, but there also were workshops and a sewing, a sewing room. The June 1911 issue of the Friedenstimme contains a very entertaining report of a field trip to Kortica, written by some of the children themselves, which shows how much effort was put into their education and well-being. Next slide. So, but perhaps the most important thing the orphans received from the Harders was the loving care and a sense of belonging that they couldn't find elsewhere. All of the children accounts I have been able to review so far show how much they respected and loved the Harder parents and how they felt loved by them, even though they had to share them with many other children. Next slide. Abraham and Justina were called Papa and Mama by the orphans, by all of them. Some of the other workers are also remembered with love and fondness by the children. Um, some of these workers later uh, adopted orphans, as was the case for the Boschmann family, for example, who took in five of the orphans. Um, next slide. And um, let me tell you about Heinrich Rempel, who later took his foster parents' name Hubert. His account, beautifully told by Hilda Dück, provides insight into the soul of a child that has lost its, his parents very early and was separated from his siblings at a young age. He fondly remembers the care he received by the Harders during the last two years of the orphanage's existence, as well as when the institution was taken over by the communists. It is noteworthy that in that difficult period of starvation and poverty filling the war, following the war, Abraham Harder would have found many families to take his orphans in, even though those families must have been struggling hard. So could it be that at least some of them had been softened by their own endured hardships? Um, next slide. There is much more to be told about the orphanage. Uh, so if anyone has any source materials to add to my collection, I'd be very grateful. Let me conclude with a farewell picture of the Harder family in June 1924 right before their son immigrated to America. So this is the farewell picture. And several years after that, Abraham and Justina Harder had to flee the Molochna. And now the next picture, um, uh, they spent their last years in a dirt hut on the Crimean Peninsula with their youngest children and their sick daughter, Anna. Justina died in 1936 in this dirt hut. Abraham was deported during Second World War and died on the way to Siberia. It took a long time until his own children in Canada found out about their true fate. So this is what I wanted to tell uh, today. And again, thank you for listening to me. And I'll be happy to hear from you what you would like to add, to comment, to ask. Thank you to Naomi. If any of you are interested in reading her thesis or articles, uh, they are, you can contact Conrad Stace at the Mennonite Archives. I've sent all of the materials to him, so you can contact him and he can contact Naomi. Our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Dekelchin. He's a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he holds a dual appointment in the Department of Jewish History and the Department of General History. His research and many publications deal with the modern Jewish world, with applied humanities, with transnational philanthropy and advocacy, non-state diplomacy, agrarian history, and migration. He will speak to us today about Ruslan Mennonites and their Jewish farming neighbors mostly in southern Ukraine, Crimea, in that area. So welcome, Dr. 
thank you and uh, many thanks to Aileen, Ben, and Jeremy for uh, inviting me to come to Winnipeg. It's a first visit, and from my uh, short conversations up to now in the last hour or so, I realize that I'm probably the only person in the room who isn't related to someone else in the room. <laughs> so, uh, but I feel, nonetheless, I feel very welcome, very, very welcome. Um, <laughs> so, uh, very well. Um, now, after the comic relief, we'll get into a subject that is perhaps new to many of you, um, but I thought that, in, in with the organizers, that it would be uh, something interesting to present, something you know, uh, quite new and, and, and quite different, I would assume. So, my premise today in, 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 today, in today's um, presentation is that there's something to be learned by comparing the lives and fates of Ruslander Mennonites to their Jewish farming neighbors in Imperial Russia and uh, the Soviet periphery, as well as Jewish farmers elsewhere during the same time period, meaning roughly the last decade of the 19th century moving into the first decades of the 20th. Time allows today only for a few points of comparison during more than a century of coexistence between Jews and Mennonites in southern Ukraine where both of these ethno-religious minorities survived under authoritarian regimes with ever-changing conditions of rural governance. It's been quite a treat to think comparatively about these two projects. I had not done it before. Uh, they're very different, but surprisingly similar. So along the way, I've thought about um, the internal workings of these two ethnic minorities, uh, both of them very distinct from the surrounding indigenous populations where these colonies arose. Um, secondly, what is the treatment of each community by the regimes, whether it's Imperial, Russian, or Soviet? What does that say about the sites of colonization? And I'll show you shortly, shortly some maps, so we'll see we're talking about exactly the same places, and the shifting political environments in which they lived, so authoritarian autocracy to Bolshevik communism. And lastly, what are the measures of success for the colonists themselves, whether we're talking about Mennonites or Jewish colonists, given that the final chapters in both of these projects, um, they came with immense trauma, uh, some of which you certainly bear here in the audience. For those less familiar with Jewish agrarianization in Russian-speaking space, here's a thumbnail sketch. Okay. Um, it all began uh, with Tsar Alexander I's Jewish statute which launched the Jewish colonization program in Imperial Russia in 1804, many decades before some of you may be familiar with a subsequent project of Jewish colonists, farming colonists in North America and in Manitoba and Saskatchewan specifically. Through this colonization to New Russia, which this area that's circled in blue uh, was called at the time New Russia, it had just been conquered and annexed uh, by his grandmother, actually, Catherine the Great, Alexander hoped to avert inter-ethnic violence that would, uh, in, in, a, in a different location where Jews actually did live in what was called, or would be called shortly, the Pale of Settlement. Today, roughly within the borders of Lithuania, Belarusia, Russia, and Ukraine, but, but not down there. Um, thirdly, like the Mennonites, um, the Russian regime wanted Jewish colonization from north to south to this area to help whiten newly annexed territories around the Black Sea. Um, the first colonists departed the Pale of Settlement and arrived around Kherson, so not far from Mennonite settlement, in 1807. They all suffered enormously because of a lack of previous experience and administrative neglect. Um, where that blue arrow is, that would be the first concentration of Jewish colonies. Again, very close to, to Mennonites. Later on, um, his successor, Alexander I's successor, Nicholas I, expanded Jewish colonization to include Bessarabia and areas further to the east around Zaporozhye and uh, Dniepropetrovsk or Dniepro or Ekaterinoslav, depending on what, uh, what time period we're talking about. 
Uh, what we see here on the map uh, is a, a, a later rendition of Jewish colonization. We'll come back to it later from in, in between the world wars. But uh, around where that era was, there were about 36 Jewish colonies before the first world war. I first, first found interactions on the land between Mennonites and Jews during the second half of the 1840s. And, and why did that take place? It turns out that Tsar Nikolai I, Nicholas I, his provincial administrators decided that something had to be done for these failing Jewish colonies. And by this time, there were, ever, there were already several Jewish colonies and a couple of thousand Jewish colonists in what was then called New Russia. So what happened? The imperial administrators placed German families, what they called German families, upon investigation, I found that they were mainly Mennonites, inside the Jewish colonies as instructors and kind of models for emulation for productive farmers so the Jews could simply learn from them also by doing and also just by observing. And as far as I could, was able to understand, about 145 of these so-called German farmers were residents of the Jewish colonies by 1858. So we do have quite a bit of interaction. Testimonies from the time uh, suggest ambivalent relations between the Jewish colonists and these instructors. And to give you just a view, I mean, the, 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 the main title of my presentation today is Mirror Images. I suppose if I were to cover up the, the captions here, you might very well think that these were Mennonite farmers. They were neighbors of the Mennonite farmers, and in this particular colony, it's one of the first, Zde Menucha, for those of you who are wondering what on earth that means. It's actually Hebrew, and it means fields of rest, and uh, initially created in 1807, and we know for a fact that there were Mennonite instructors in this colony, as well as many others. Um, New cross community and, and, oh, I'm sorry, some of these so-called Germans, again, mostly Mennonites, and their descendants continued to live in the Jewish colonies at least until the outbreak of the First World War. New cross community uh, interactions emerged during the Russian Civil War, so roughly uh, 1919 until 1921, with the participation of Mennonite and Jewish philanthropic organizations in Herbert Hoover's American Relief Administration. Uh, of the many participating faith-based philanthropies in the ARA, as it was called, only the Quakers, Mennonites, and Jews remained in Russia after Herbert Hoover took everyone home back to the States in 1923. Before engaging in directly in comparison uh, between Mennonites and Jews, let's state what this paper does not include, even though there could be some informative comparisons. First of all, something that you may have heard of, perhaps, those of you who are interested in Soviet history, um, the experiment called Birobijan, Birobijan in the Soviet Far East on the Chinese border. I'm not comparing it because that was really an act of political theater by Stalin, and it had very little real to it. I'm just clicking through. We don't have a lot of time. Just to give you some views of what was going on. Uh, this, uh, what we see here, is a, uh, a Jewish farm school, which is a major element of this, of this project. Um, and to just have a look at what they seemed like. This was a Jewish colony, this one in Crimea, in central Crimea around Jankoy. So again, quite close to Mennonite communities from the 1930s. And as you can see, this is now a planned community built entirely by Jewish philanthropic organizations from abroad. Um, and as you can see here, it, uh, this was of course posed for publicity purposes, um, but you can see here a multi-generational Jewish farming family, much like their Mennonite neighbors. The key here, however, and, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is what they're standing in front of, which is a John Deere tractor in 1925, 1925 in Crimea or southern Ukraine, I'm not quite sure where they were, um, which would have been like science fiction to the local uh, to the local peasants. Um, and in fact, the agro joint, which was sort of the philanthropic arm of Jewish philanthropy in, from abroad in the Soviet Union, imported the first 90 tractors into Russia, period. There were no tractors in Russia, to the best of my knowledge, beforehand. So, um, we have um, within all of this some tantalizing comparisons between um, well, 
Okay, some tantalizing comparisons, again, just to give us some visuals. I won't talk about each one of them. Um, one of them is the trait, and I'm, I'm speaking here a little bit out of school because I'm by far, in, or by no measure, a, a, a scholar of Mennonite history or in Mennonite uh, uh, colonial history, but there, does seem to be, there do seem to be trends of fragmentation. Jewish colonies fragmented and split apart pretty much at the rate that Mennonite colonies did as well for slightly different reasons uh, that, we'll, um, that, that we can perhaps discuss later on. So what are some of the similarities between the Jewish and the Mennonite uh, experience? And we'll go back here. Uh, this is, um, as I spoke about before, Bessarabia and um, uh, some scenes from Bessarabia itself. As I said, it was expanded here. This is the Biro Bijan sort of uh, charade, uh, Stalinist charade, but it, it, it certainly did exist. And now we're back to sort of the, the motherland in southern Ukraine and, and Crimea. So what were some of the, the similarities between these two experiments? Again, beginning from the early 1800s and until the Second World War. First, there were multiple sites of resettlement. It wasn't just in one place that evolved depending on political conditions. Secondly, both the Jewish and the Mennonite settlement patterns, they had overarching centralized bodies that negotiated for the colonists themselves with state and local authorities. And both Jews and Mennonites did become targets for rural violence. They themselves were not violent towards each other the Mennonites and the Jews, but they were subject to rural violence way before anyone heard Stalin's name. For example, after the assassination of the Tsar Alexander II, um, the Mennonite colonies in this area were not touched, whereas Jewish colonies were ravaged by pogroms, uh, as much of the rest of the Jewish population in the Russian Empire was. However, things changed during, well, things got even doubt, let's say, in a very tragic way during the Russian Civil War, where Mennonite colonies in this area were ravaged during uh, um, what were called uh, Machnoz, pog Machnoz pogroms, a uh, kind of wild peasant revolt that ravaged everything in its path, and the Mennonites just happened to be there. And the Jews as well, Jewish colonies also were, underwent uh, a series of pogroms during this time. Um, by and large, from the early 1880s, from that first wave of pogroms after the assassination of Alexander, until the Second World War, or through the Civil War, certainly, attacks against Jews and the Ruslanders were fueled by ethnic, national, and also class-based uh, hatreds. Because as it turns out, both the Jewish colonists and the Ruslanders were far better off than their indigenous neighbors, by and large, which engendered jealousies, envy, and so on. Chaos is a wonderful time to settle old scores. And that's exactly what became of both Jewish colonists here and Mennonites. With the coming of Bolshevik rule to Crimea in the 1920s, generally speaking, the indigenous peoples, which would have included by that point Lutheran, Germans, Swiss, Estonians, Greek, Bulgars, and Ruslanders, all of them in Crimea by that time for generations, were suspect in the Kremlin and among the local rulers who were all Tatar communists. So we can blame Stalin for all sorts of things. I mean, it's always fair game, right? But there was also another element in all of this where the local Tatar leaders who had just been empowered by the Bolshevik Revolution. Both of them, both Moscow and Simferopol, the regional capital, saw the Mennonites as kulaks, as wealthy peasants who needed to be eliminated. Um, and Crimea's indigenous communist rulers, these same Tatars, they considered Jewish colonists as interlopers who were soaking up lands through arrangements with the Soviet government that they believed that other Tatars should be able to farm. So they worked very hard to evict, essentially, or to prevent Jewish farmers, Jewish colonists, from coming down from the same area of the Pale of Settlement down here. Um, in 1929, Jewish colonists in this area, the areas that we see here in Ruslanders, had similar populations. There were about, as far as, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are many more experts here than I know, there are about 79,000 Ruslanders in this general area. There are about 100,000 Jewish colonists, again, most of them relatively recent arrivals. They both introduced advanced intensive farming methods, 
uh, facilitated mostly by that transnational fraternal aid. We saw the John Deere tractor. There are many other uh, examples of this. Um, and here we, oh, not yet, not yet. sorry. Um, okay, um, the individual household farms in both communities were tied together by a high level of cooperativism, uh, particularly marketing cooperatives, something that gets overlooked a lot, I find, in the, in the Mennonite histories that I have uh, um, read. It was a huge secret of their success is not just sort of the individual ingenuity, but this reliance, this understanding of economies of scale. It's a very advanced concept for the time. Jewish colonies, for slightly different reasons, took that on as well, and hence a reason for their wealth. Um, the preservation of identity was also central in these colonization projects. Of course, you know more than I about how central it was for Mennonite communities, but the Jewish architects of Jewish colonization saw these colonies as sites where a kind of biblical Jew could be, ref could be uh, um, recreated and thereby empowering Jews and, and thrusting aside anti-Semitic tropes, anti-Semitic views that had, of course, been very popular in Eastern Europe at that time both in terms of similarities, both of them end tragically, both the uh, Ruslander experience and Jewish experience. You know about the Ruslanders, I'm sure we'll hear more. The Jewish colonies themselves are all wiped out um, during the Nazi invasion of the area. So sometime between the summer of 1941 and the autumn of 1942, um, almost all of the, by then, 200,000 Jewish colonists are murdered. In, um, in um, ravines near, very near their own homes. This is just one, I photographed it um, a couple of years ago. It's actually a Soviet monument in that same place that I showed you before, Zde Menucha. So the children and grandchildren of the people that we saw in those photos are buried here uh, and murdered very close to their homes. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the last remnant of the Ruslander presence in Soviet Russia was in Gnadenfeld, and its colonists evacuated with the Wehrmacht in 1943. Differences, differences. First of all, with longevity. Uh, the Mennonite rural agricultural life has continued uninterrupted for centuries um, across migratory resettlement patterns to Canada, Paraguay, and elsewhere. But by and large, Jewish farms everywhere um, suffer from what I call the dilemma of the second or the third generation. The pioneer farmers go and they settle. They have some success. Many of their sons and their daughters decide to move on to easier, better lives. Almost all of their grandchildren decide that farming is not for them. So it tends to be, no matter where it starts and when it starts, a very short-term process uh, for uh, most Jewish uh, uh, colonization. Uh, other differences, isolation versus integration. Um, Mennonite colonies, as you know, tended to and generally succeeded in remaining culture, culturally and socially isolated from their surroundings. And when they didn't, they move off and create new colonies. I would imagine we'll hear about some of that as well. But while Jewish colonists sought safety and economic stability in rural resettlement and away from anti-Semitic neighbors, they didn't really want to isolate themselves from their surroundings. That being said, Jewish colonists like Mennonites and other European colonists created and operated their own schools for kids as well as orphanages and other things and taught them mostly in the Yiddish language, not in Russian, uh, until that became unpopular in the mid-1930s. Um, time is up already. Well, that's it then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I have a w whole world to cover, but no time to do it in. Um, so if that is the committee's decision, then I will um, thank you, and I suppose you can read the rest of it um, when we get around to, with Ben's help, publishing in, in uh, Mennonite Studies. So, of course, if there are questions and, and you know, I can expand on things, that would be great, and if not, in any case, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off, but <laughs> we have to, well, we might have a late lunch. 
Uh, <coughs> our next, uh, <coughs> sorry, our next speaker, Dr. Al Alfred Eisfeld, was born in the Udmurt Republic of uh, the Soviet Union in sort of north central Russia. And he grew up in the Almata region of Kazakhstan. In 1973, the Eisfeld family was finally able to emigrate to uh, West Germany. They'd been trying for years, but they were finally able to leave. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Eisfeld uh, studied uh, the history of Eastern, Euro Eastern and Southeastern European history and newspaper science, uh, first in Bonn and then in Munich, where he graduated with his PhD in 1983. Since 1987, to the present. He's been involved as a research assistant and then eventually director of the Göttinger Arbeitskreis in Göttingen, Germany. <clears throat> um, and he was also a member of several other international uh, German societies. <clears throat> he has written and uh, edited, I would say, several hundred books and articles on the history of especially on the history of uh, Germans, including Mennonites, in, in the Russian Empire, in the Soviet Union, and in all the states, republics that have survived, you know, come out of the Soviet Union. His most recent book <coughs> is this one, Wie soll es weitergehen? How shall things happen from here? <coughs> Which is a, a collection of over 400 pages of over 150 original Mennonite documents from the, just from the years March 1917 to December 1918, just those two years, very pivotal years. <coughs> you know, the, they had, <coughs> excuse me, they had survived the First World War and, and the, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution happened, and then they asked themselves, you know, what happens now? Do we, do we stay? under the Bolsheviks, or do we leave, emigrate? And so this is a phenomenal uh, book. I've been, help, I've been working with Dr. Eisfeld on this book. And his, his talk today will be about several aspects of, of these two years in Mennonite history, 1917 to 1918. He will be giving his lecture in German. Uh, I've translated it into English. The English text will be on the screen. Uh, and um, if you have questions later or talk to him later, uh, he understands English, but uh, he <laughs> doesn't really speak it. So, uh, Dr. Eisfeld. Herzlichen Dank Ihnen für die freundliche Einladung und für die Einführung uh, hier zum uh, Vortrag. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, der Zeitraum von 1917 bis 1919 ist eine sehr kurze Zeitspanne, aber sehr ereignisreich. Und ich werde mich hier allerdings nur mit den Jahren 1917 und 18 befassen, weil wir einfach nicht genug Zeit haben, um alle drei Jahrgänge abzuhandeln, aber einen Ausblick gebe ich. Nun, die erste Periode wäre von März bis Dezember 1917, die zweite von Dezember 1917 bis Dezember 1918. Warum, werden Sie gleich auch sehen. Die Bildung der provisorischen Regierung und deren Proklamation des Selbstbestimmungsrechts aller Völker Russlands die Suspendierung der Liquidationsgesetze und die Zulassung der politischen Betätigung verschiedener Parteien und Vereine erzeugte auch bei Mennoniten eine Aufbruchstellung. Diese konnte anhand von Dokumenten des sogenannten Mennonitischen Archivs, heute im Gebietsarchiv Odessa, anhand von Schriftstücken aus anderen Archiven der Ukraine und Veröffentlichungen in der wiederbelebten deutschen Presse untersucht und eben in dem äh, eben gezeigten äh, Band zusammengebracht werden. Äh, leider kann ich ihn heute Ihnen noch nicht präsentieren. Es haben ein paar Wochen äh, Zeit gefehlt. In äh, Halbstadt Malachansk begann Ende, äh, Ende März 1917 eine Entwicklung, die es bis dahin in den Mennonitenkolonien nicht gab. 
Am 29. März wurde eine Kommission für die Vorbereitung auf die Wahlen in die verfassunggebende Versammlung Russlands unter dem Vorsitz von Johann Wilms, einem Mühlenbesitzer, gebildet. Und am nächsten Tag beriet diese Kommission bereits schon über den Entwurf einer Satzung des Molochne Politischen Vereins. Eine Woche später konnte über den, äh, einen Teil der politischen Plattform äh, beraten werden, die folgende Kapitel enthielt. Grundrechte, Staatsaufbau, Gericht, Finanzen, Bildung, Arbeiterfrage. Die Themensetzung unterschied sich komplett von den äh, Tagesordnungspunkten der bisherigen allgemeinen Mennonitenkonferenzen. An der von äh, Professor äh, Karl Lindemann nach Moskau einberufenen Sitzung von äh, 86 Vertretern aus 15 Gouvernements und Gebieten des Russischen Reiches vom 20. bis 22. April 1917 nahmen auch drei Mennoniten teil, darunter der Duma-Abgeordnete äh, Peter Schröder aus Militopol und der Abgeordnete in der Landschaftsversammlung des Gouvernements Taurien, Abraham Klassen. In dieser Sitzung wurde eine ganze Reihe von Beschlüssen gefasst, beginnend mit der Bildung eines Komitees für die Vertretung der Interessen der russischen Bürger deutscher Volkszugehörigkeit und der Mennoniten, der Bildung von lokalen Komitees und darauf aufbauend eines allrussischen Zentralkomitees russischer Bürger deutscher Volkszugehörigkeit und der Mennoniten. Die zu verfolgenden Ziele wurden laut Protokoll als politisch-ökonomische Plattform verstanden. Bis zur Gründung des Zentralkomitees sollte ein sechsköpfiges äh, Komitee äh, die Leitung wahrnehmen. In dieses Komitee wurde auch Peter Schröder gewählt. Ende April oder in der ersten Maiwoche hat in Halbstadt ähm, äh, hat der in Halbstadt gebildete Ausschuss mit einem in 3000 Exemplaren gedruckten Flugblatt alle Mennoniten zur Bildung von Vereinen sowie zur Wahl von Delegierten für, die einzuberufende allgemein, für den einzuberufenden allgemeinen Mennonitischen Kongress aufgerufen. Dieses Flugblatt wurde in alle mennonitischen Siedlungsgebiete bis nach Sibirien und in das Talastal in Kirgisien geschickt. Berichte über die Vereinsgründungen im ganzen Lande wurden nach Halbstadt geschickt, womit die Führungsrolle des Ausschusses anerkannt war. Am 17. Mai haben Vertreter der mennonitischen Siedlungen der Wollest Halbstadt ein Zentralbüro mit Sitz in Neuhalbstadt für die Erledigung der laufenden Geschäfte gewählt, das man Männerzentrum nannte. Der Verein bekam äh, die Bezeichnung Malochne Mennonitenverband. Nach einem Vortrag von Benjamin Unruh über die Notwendigkeit und das Ziel einer Organisation wurde die Frage, ob wir als Mennoniten überhaupt am politischen Leben des Landes aktiv teilnehmen dürfen, positiv beantwortet. Am 30. Mai beschloss äh, das Büro, die von Johann Wilms und Benjamin Unruh ausgearbeitete 20-seitige Broschüre mit dem Titel »Wie organisieren wir Mennoniten uns für die Nationalversammlung« in einer Auflage von 3000 Exemplaren zu drucken und in alle Siedlungsgebiete zugänglich zu machen. In der Allgemeinen Mennonitischen Konferenz, die vom 6. bis 8. Juni in Neuhalbstadt tagte, haben sich die Teilnehmer nach Vorträgen der Delegierten der mobilisierten Mennoniten über die Reorganisation der allgemeinen Konferenz grundsätzlich für eine bürgerliche Organisation des Mennonitentums in Russland ausgesprochen, auch ein Novum. Von den 297 Teilnehmern dieser Konferenz stellten Gemeindes, äh, Gemeindeälteste und Prediger mit 150 äh, Personen mehr als die Hälfte. Sie haben es also voll mitgetragen. Am äh, 14. August fanden sich 198 Delegierte in Orlov zur Teilnahme am Allgemeinen Mennonitischen Kongress ein, der auf Initiative des Büros der MVV ins Leben gerufen wurde.
also nicht mehr die allgemeine Konferenz, sondern ein Kongress, ein bürgerlicher Kongress. In Sektionen und im Plenum wurden zahlreiche Fragen diskutiert und Wünsche formuliert, die an eine zukünftige Regierung oder an mennonitische, antimennonitische Gemeinschaft adressiert waren und nicht sofortiges Handeln erforderten. Als lebhaft wurde die Aussprache über die für Mennoniten wichtige Frage der Wehrlosigkeit bewertet. Die Äußerungen äh, reichten von, Zitat, alle Mennoniten in Waffentragende und Waffenlose zu teilen, über äh, Unterscheiden zwischen persönlicher und kollektiver Wehrlosigkeit, aktiv am Kampf um den Frieden äh, beteiligen, Propaganda treiben gegen den Krieg und gegen den Kapitalismus als Ursache des Krieges, bis hin zu die Wehrlosigkeit ist eine religiöse Frage, ein schönes Ideal, das in der Praxis nicht durchführbar ist. Also die Bandbreite war riesig. Die verabschiedete Resolution lautete, der Kongress steht fest und unerschütterlich auf dem Boden des Wehrlosigkeitsprinzips. Also nichts Neues. Der ständige Mennonitische Kongress sollte für die Regelung aller bürgerlichen Angelegenheiten der Mennoniten zuständig werden. Seine Aufgaben wurden in einer Sektion formuliert und im Plenum vorgetragen, Dort haben die Versammelten das Projekt zur Kenntnis genommen, aber abgelehnt, die einzelnen Punkte zu besprechen. Das Ergebnis blieb somit weit hinter den Absichten zurück. Auf die politisch-gesellschaftliche Entwicklung außerhalb der mennonitischen Gemeinschaft hatte dieser Kongress, soweit man das sehen kann, keine Wirkung erreicht. Also bei der Bildung der ukrainischen Regierung und der Ausarbeitung von verschiedenen Projektvorschlägen waren Mennoniten in diesem Sinne nicht beteiligt, trotz der Aufbruchstimmung. Die zweite Periode, Dezember 17 bis Dezember 1918, nach der Machtergreifung der Bolschewiki in Petrograd und Moskau, begann der Zerfall des Russischen Reiches. In der Ukraine zogen sich die Bolschewiki aus der Zentralrate in Kiew nach Kharkov zurück und proklamierten dort am 25. Dezember die ukrainische Sowjetrepublik als Teil Sowjetrusslands. In Sevastopol, Jekaterinoslav, Odessa und Kiew kam es zu bolschewistischen Aufständen und Kiew wurde von aus Russland entsandten äh, Truppen unter der Führung von Muravjow äh, besetzt. Ab Januar 1918 gab es wiederholt Raubüberfälle auf äh, Landgüter in den Gouvernements Taurin und Jekaterinoslav und äh, Verhaftungen von Mennoniten. Die ukrainische Regierung äh, konnte dagegen nichts unternehmen. Am 9. Januar 1918 hat die Zentralrate das Gesetz über die nationalpersonale Autonomie erlassen, bei dessen Verwirklichung die deutsche und mennonitische Bevölkerung eine gewisse Selbstverwaltung hätte bekommen können. Einen Monat später, am 9. Februar, haben die Zentralmächte mit der ukrainischen Volksrepublik den Friedensvertrag von Brest-Litovsk geschlossen. Im Zusatzvertrag war eine Regelung über die Versorgung über die Fürsorge für die Rückwanderer enthalten. Die Rückwanderung sollte binnen zehn Jahren unter Mitnahme des Erlöses für das liquidierte Eigentum möglich sein. Im Februar und März war im Volksfreund in Berdjansk erschienen, wiederholt von Raubüberfällen und Todesopfern zu lesen. Es war daher kein Zufall, dass dann am 6. April 1918 über die Auswanderung nach Australien und Argentinien und am 13. April nach Australien, Neuseeland oder Brasilien berichtet wurde. In dieser Bedrohungslage wurden die von der ukrainischen Regierung ins Land zur Hilfe gerufenen Truppen der Mittelmächte als Rettung gesehen. Deutsche Truppen kamen in Halbstadt am 19. April an. Sie wurden freudig begrüßt. Es gab aber auch andere äh, Ideen. Pastor Emanuel Winkler als Leiter des Vertrauensrates der Deutschen und Mennoniten machte sich stark für die Idee der Schaffung einer Kronkolonie Krim-Taurien 
in die alle Deutschen und Mennoniten Russlands äh, umgesiedelt werden sollten. Sie sollten äh, alle die deutsche Staatsangehörigkeit damit den äh, dauerhaften Schutz bekommen. Zur Unterstützung dieser Forderungen führte Pastor Winkler in Odessa auf der Krim und am 14. Mai in Prischip einen sogenannten Kongress durch, in der an die Reichsleitung und die oberste Heeresleitung Deutschlands gerichtete Resolution hieß es, Zitat, wir stellen uns und unsere Söhne der deutschen Heeresleitung zur Verfügung, wo immer es auch sei. Zitat Ende. Das entsprach aber der Auffassung der Mennoniten von der Wehrlosigkeit in keiner Weise. Für Mennoniten äh, trübte sich die, trübten sich die Hoffnungen weiter ein, als der Vertreter der ukrainischen äh, Regierung am äh, 14. Mai 18 in Militopol äh, angeregt hat, einen aus äh, Landbesitzern und dessen Söhnen bestehenden Selbstschutz und die Abstellung von 50 äh, Mann jeden Bezirks nach Kiew zum Schutz äh, des Hetmans äh, abzustellen. Wenig später forderte äh, die deutsche Kommandatur in Berdjansk die am 30. Juni zusammengetretene Bundeskonferenz dazu auf, bis zum 4. Juli, also binnen weniger Tage, eine prinzipielle Stellungnahme zur Aufstellung eines Selbstschutzes für die Kolonien ab, abzugeben. Die Gemeinden sollten schon bis zum 4. Juli Listen derjenigen vorlegen, die sich weigern, äh, die Waffen zu nehmen. Bernhard Wiens, ein Teilnehmer des Kongresses, gab zu bedenken, Zitat, wir haben uns bis jetzt mit äh, Idealen beschäftigt und die Wirklichkeit aus dem Auge äh, gelassen. Wir müssen daran denken, dass wir unrettbar äh, Raubmördern preisgegeben sind, wenn wir den militärischen Schutz verlieren und auf den Selbstschutz verzichten. Zitat Ende. Letztendlich wurde eine Resolution äh, gefasst, wonach äh, die Mennonitische Bundeskonferenz an dem bisherigen Bekenntnis zur Wehrlosigkeit festhält, dem Einzelnen aber keinen äh, Zwang auferlegt, wenn er die Waffen in die Hand nimmt. Schon wenige Tage später war in der Friedensstimme zu in einem vermutlich von reichsdeutscher Seite eingebrachten Beitrag zu lesen, Zitat, dass dem Befehl der ukrainischen Regierung, sich die, der ukrainischen Aushebungskommission zu stellen, die deutschen Kolonisten in gleicher Weise unterworfen sind wie alle anderen Mitglieder des ukrainischen Staates. Die kollektive Aufnahme aller Kolonisten äh, des Schwarzmeergebietes wurde von der äh, Regierung Deutschlands auf dem äh, Kronrat am 2. Juli 1918 abgelehnt. Und äh, General Ludendorff betonte für die oberste Heeresleitung, Zitat, bei der Frage der deutschen Kolonisten ist es wichtig, ob die jungen Leute dienen wollen oder nicht. Zitat Ende. Dass Mennoniten dazu nicht bereit waren, ging aus den Resolutionen der Bundeskonferenz klar hervor. Der wohl wichtigste Tagesordnungspunkt der allgemeinen Mennonitischen, des Allgemeinen Mennonitischen Kongresses vom 18. bis 21. September 18 in Orlov war der Bericht von Johann Wilms, der als Mitglied des Vertrauensrates der deutschen Kolonisten im Schwarzmeergebiet sich über die Möglichkeit der Rückwanderung nach Deutschland und deren äh, Ansiedlung dort äh, zu informieren hatte. Er berichtete, dass äh, für die Niederlassung in Deutschland noch nichts getan worden ist. Die Aufnahme von Arbeitern sei möglich, doch die Ansiedlung in größeren äh, Komplexen ist nicht möglich. Für uns Mennoniten ein Faktor, der äußerst schwer in die Waagschale für, äh, fällt. Nach der Debatte über die Frage der, einer Rückwanderung kam man zum Schluss, Zitat, unser oberstes Prinzip ist die Wahrung unserer nationalen und konfessionellen Existenz und Eigenart. Sollte ein Verbleiben in der Ukraine nur unter Aufopferung dieser Existenz und Eigenart möglich sein, so wäre eine Massenrückwanderung bzw. Auswanderung geboten. Johann Wilms gab auch Folgendes zu Protokoll, Zitat, für das Verbleiben in der Ukraine müssen gewisse Garantien gegeben sein, 
der ein gesichertes Leben in wirtschaftlicher, nationaler und kultureller Hinsicht gewährleisten. Das wäre zu erstreben durch eine exterritoriale Autonomie. Man würde zum Ende in Aussicht nehmen, Freiheit und Selbstverwaltung von Kirche, Schule und Gemeinde, besondere Verwaltungszentrale, proportionelle Vertretung in der Kammer, also im Parlament, und einen Kommissar bei der Regierung. Wenn auch diese Autonomie vertragsmäßig gesichert werden könnte, so kann man ihr doch nur einen temporären Wert zumessen, ganz in Abhängigkeit von der Orientierung der zukünftigen inneren und äußeren Politik. In der anschließenden Debatte wurde wiederholt, dass, Zitat, wir als Hauptbedingung für das Verbleiben in der Ukraine die Wahrung unserer nationalen und religiösen Eigenart, äh, Eigenart stellen. Wir wollen vollberechtigte Bürger und nichts weniger sein. Die kulturelle Autonomie muss unsere bürgerliche Vollfreiheit garantieren. Andernfalls wäre Rückwanderung bzw. Auswanderung geboten. Für das Sondieren der Möglichkeiten einer Auswanderung nach Übersee setzte sich auf dem Kongress Benjamin Unruh ein. Ab Oktober 1918 kam es verstärkt zu Überfällen der Machno-Banden, den Selbstschutzabteilungen nur da und dort Widerstand leisten konnten. Nach den Novemberrevolutionen in Berlin und Wien wurden die deutschen und österreichisch-ungarischen Truppen aus der Ukraine abgezogen. Die Mennonitengemeinden auf ukrainischem Gebiet blieben ohne militärischen Schutz und Einbindung in den Staatsaufbau, auch den ukrainischen Staatsaufbau, zurück. Nach zwei Jahren intensiver Diskussionen über die Gegenwart und Zukunftsaussichten des Mennonitentums in Russland bildeten die Wehrlosigkeit und die Wahrung der nationalen und religiösen Eigenart den Kern ihrer Identität. Zu deren Wahrung richteten sich nun die Blicke mehr nach Übersee. Und das Jahr 1919 mit den Kämpfen, mit den Vernichtungen ganzer Kolonien, mit der Fluchtbewegung erst auf die Krim und dann äh, eben eine Ausweglosigkeit in dem äh, neuen Staat, äh, Ukrainische Republik und später Sowjetukraine, hat dann äh, gezeigt, dass äh, die Mennoniten im Grunde genommen eine gut organisierte Minderheit, aber schon fast ein Fremdkörper im ukrainischen äh, Staate waren. Ich danke Ihnen für die Aufmerksamkeit. Vielen Dank, Herr Dr. Eisfeld. And for good and for, for last, we get to hear from Aileen Friesen. You've already met her, Dr. Aileen Friesen. She is a an associate professor here at the U of W, the executive director of the Plett Foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, and the co-director of the Center uh, for Transnational Mennonite Studies. She is also the editor of Preservings, a magazine published by the Plett Foundation. Her research interests include the history of Mennonites, uh, especially their experiences in the Russian Empire, Uh, where she wrote her doctoral thesis, uh, then later the Soviet Union, and also in Latin America, and the history of migration in the 19th, 19th and 20th centuries. She has written extensively on all of these topics. Again, you can contact her to get copies of all these papers and whatever else. Her talk today focuses on the fate of Mennonite women during the years of the Civil War in Russia in the early 19, late, late 19, 1920s. Thank you, Peter. And before I start, I would like to provide a warning to the audience that some of the information uh, that I will be sharing will be difficult to hear as it deals with sexual violence, and I invite you to make the assessment of whether it is best for you to either mute me or to exit the room. This topic is important to understanding the Ruslander experience. Nonetheless, it is unpleasant and um, 
And so more of these details will be given later on in my presentation to give you the chance to make that decision for yourself. I want to point out also that this presentation is preliminary um, because of the sensitive nature of the topic. Digging through sources is necessary and a time-consuming process, and it's highly likely as I continue, continue researching this project, which is part of a broader project funded through the Social Sciences and Humanities Council, Research Council, Council of Canada, that some of these uh, preliminary conclusions might be altered or changed to reflect my new research. And so one of the paradoxes of the Civil War is that it happens to be one of the most written about uh, periods. There's a lot of literature, a lot of memoirs, a lot of um, memories of the Civil War, but it's also the least understood period. And this isn't surprising. Civil wars, the breakdown of authority, the breakdown of relations between groups, uh, between neighbors, are often difficult to comprehend. However, this complexity is not the only reason. The framing of the Civil War within Mennonite histori historiography has predominantly, although not exclusively, focused on the question of the self-defense units, debating whether or not taking up arms betrayed Mennonite values of non-resistance. But what happens when we ask some different questions? Questions like, how did Mennonite women view the violence that surrounded them during the Civil War? What strategies did they deploy to navigate this violence? And what does the broader context of violence tell us about the gendered experience of the Civil War? Obviously, Mennonites were not the only group to experience violence, and were not the only group to be forced to make difficult decisions or to have their agency stolen from them. And so in this rephrasing, um, in this re sort of uh, rephrasing of this topic, it's also useful to keep in mind that uh, Dr. Marlene Epp, who is up in the audience, has also written about the experience of sexual violence um, by Soviet Mennonite women during World War II, and that's especially helpful to help us navigate this issue. So first we have the issue of how to define violence. During the Civil War period in southern Ukraine, Mennonite villages were regularly the sites of violence as, anti -Bolshevik, as the anti-Bolshevik White Army, the Bolshevik Red Army, anarchists, most, most notably Nestor Makhnol and his groups, uh, nationalists and warlords all fought each other for control of the region. Mennonite villages were often on the front lines of fighting, experiencing bombing, bombardment, shooting, and other types of violence. This presentation, however, will focus on interpersonal violence or the threat of interpersonal violence, which Mennonites as civilians encountered primarily from the Maknosi and the other warlords roaming the countryside. Now at times, admittedly, it's difficult to tell people apart. However, Mennonites overwhelmingly, although not exclusively, and there's always exceptions in these cases, but they overwhelmingly identify the source of interpersonal violence as being committed by, quote, bandits uh, and not soldiers. Uh, and there is, there is an acknowledgement that everyone requisitions food, horses, etc., but that only certain groups are identified as regularly engaging in intimidating, humiliating, and in sometimes um, murderous behavior. So in, these, in this context, um, mothers, Mennonite mothers, often put themselves in danger to diffuse situations with the men who barged into their yards and houses. In some cases, this involved taking the position of authority with these men. Gertrude Barg remembered when the Maknosi entered uh, the, vi the village of Hirschau and visited her family. They demanded to see the, quote, boss, and her widowed mother came out and responded, I am the boss. Uh, and they, she engaged, proceeded to engage in conversation with them. In the end, they borrowed her wagon and her son, and they had promised that both were, would be returned, and in this case, they were. Uh, later on, they also reappeared in this village, uh, which was inundated by violence, and the, the family experienced um, another set of violence. In another case, case, Agatha Nichol recalled how brave her mother had to be on many occasions to protect her five daughters. In one instance, her mother ordered the girls and her father to hide when a group of men barged into their home uh, while they were banging on the door. Agatha's mother opened the door, welcoming the men into the home and inviting them to dinner. And once they had been properly fed, and this was her technique to calm the situation, then the father appeared in the room uh, and no harm came to that family that night. Uh, it is clear from Agatha's description that rape was the uh, outcome that the family was hoping to avoid. As she related, 
we, quote, we were all girls and it was very dangerous for us, end of quote, communicating without directly mentioning the outcome that they, fear, that they desperately feared. Feeding strangers, masking oneself in revelry were all part of the charade of the terrified. Uh, the actions and activities of those trying to avoid escalating the situation or antagonizing those who held their fate. Being good hosts, accepting humiliation were all parts of strategies for survival, especially when villages were occupied. Hoping to ingratiate themselves to those in power for protection, women often bore the burden of this interaction. At other times, mothers didn't take the chance. Um, they would hide their daughters and young children during raids on Mennonite villages. In the case of Mary Epp, her mother gathered up her daughters and took them to a poor home in the village of, of Kronsweide for the night when the bandits, bandits stormed the village. Uh, during a later raid, Mary's father and brother would both be murdered. At times, escalation was unavoidable, and in these circumstances, Mennonites often used a variety of techniques to plead with or humanize themselves in front of their tormentors. Prayers in German, and especially in Russian, were an attempt to convince people, bandits not to kill them. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it did not. I would also add that language was used in other contexts to diffuse tense situations. The historian David Rempel recalled how his mother went to visit the mother of one man, Abram Lowen, who had been hunted and then murdered by the Mahnolsi. So she wanted to visit the mother to give her condolences and to bring food. And she knew that visiting that household was very dangerous. And in order to quell any tensions, as she was walking towards that house, she started speaking in Ukrainian uh, to communicate that she was just going, uh, had no other intentions. And it was clearly to dispel any sort of misinterpretations of her actions. Uh, during this period of intense uh, violence from the fall of 1918 to 1920, we have a number of accounts of rape, especially mass rape, in, the late, 19, in late 1919. Now, sometimes it's difficult to create a timeline as uh, people only record it as something that happened, not necessarily giving an actual date. So rape can be used as a tool of war. However, it doesn't have to be. As Dara Kane Conan states, quote, while rape is a serious problem in many wars, it is not, it is not ubiquitous in every war. So it, it doesn't mean that it needs to happen, and sometimes we just assume that it does, but in fact, it doesn't always have to happen. Um, it can be used as a military strategy, as a tool of ethnic cleansing or genocide, or as a tool of socialization, according to her research. And so although rape is difficult to assess, we can find two trends. First, rape happened everywhere within the Mennonite spaces in southern Ukraine. In other words, we find reports of rape from most of the major settlements. Uh, this tells us that it was a technique and a tool within the Civil War, not an individual decision-making process in the moment. Supporting this point is the fact that rape was indis indiscriminate. There are several reports that emphasize that age was not a factor. So children, including boys to elderly women, were raped. And it is also notable uh, a variety of different sources speak to this issue. So diaries, interviews, newspaper accounts, memoirs all raise the issue of rape. And to expand briefly on the idea that while well, rape is a serious problem in war, that it doesn't always necessarily happen in wars, uh, this is important to remember. And this is I was partially thinking through this issue because I was studying the the um, what happened in the Tetic colony in the Tetic province uh, during late 1917 to early 1918, in which um, the neighbors of Mennonites forcibly removed them through violence. And in this case, uh, rape practically didn't happen. There were only, according to people who sort of um, memorialized this exodus, there were only two accounts of rape. So it was not systemic uh, in this particular um, region within the violence that was happening. And this is in contrast to the Mennonite communities in southern Ukraine, where it seems to be the Mennonite community itself understood that this was a collective strategy that was being done to them. Um, so C.E. Crable stated the following. So he comes to this region in order to help out. Uh, he's not from the region. He comes to the region in order to help out. And he says the following, quote, the Machnol had syphilis bands that they sent to each village that they wanted especially to punish. And these had instructions to rape all they could get a hold of from eight-year-olds to 80-year-olds. So it seems that it was systemic. Uh, it's important to remember that 
the focus of the accounts of rape are primarily identifying members of, quote, bandits or Mokhnulsi. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell, distinguish between the two of them. Um, but it doesn't focus particularly on necessarily the Red Army, although there are some cases, and the White Army, although there are also some cases. This is in strong contrast to what we see within the Jewish community, in which there is um, the similar experience of rape taking place, but it is being um, done by, quote, anti-Bolshevik forces. Uh, so there is, uh, and particularly the white army, which also raises the question for us that since there were a number of Mennonite men who participated in the white army, what can we then um, draw out of that? And there still is more research that needs to be done, but absolutely uh, there are accounts of Mennonite men who are in the white army who are then describing in the recollections of that time what are pogroms against Jews. Uh, also describing what is clearly mass rape against Jews. Um, they, in the particular one that I read, did not identify themselves as participating in that, but de absolutely, definitely, they witnessed it. So if we can draw a few parallels between the two, um, similar to Jewish victims, Mennonite victims and descriptions of Mennonite victims also don't use names. Uh, this was a commonality between the two communities, one way in which they uh, was used to most likely protect um, the integrity of the person who experienced um, the rape. There is also ways in which uh, so this is the shroud of secrecy that, that sort of makes it a difficult uh, issue in order to look into academically, but also was a tool used by the community in order to deal and address with the situation. Um, we also have aspects in which um, decades later, People have a hard time articulating what had happened. In some cases, there is even blame of the victim. Uh, that is, seems to be one way in which the community can also deal with trauma, is that instead of identifying it um, as something that was horrible that happened to them, they try to explain it. So in one case, I found a description of a rape, and a Mennonite woman sort of blamed it on the other Mennonite woman's blasphemy uh, as being the root of the cause of it. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that the trauma was not only borne by the victim of rape, but because these were, these were often public acts which took place in front of family members or other acquaintances, uh, and that they were systemic, this becomes both a shared, uh, a, a shared experience by people and also a shared investment in moving on quickly from it. So we don't have a lot of sources that tell us what happened in the aftermath, other than the hospitals were filled uh, with girls and women being treated for syphilis, especially in the Hortiza colony. So to conclude, even though we have many gaps in the information that exists, uh, we can find enough information to begin analyzing both women's response to the threat of interpersonal violence and the systemic targeting of Mennonite children and women outside of the framework of the self-defense units, and only when we bring these stories into our understanding of the Civil War will a fuller picture emerge.